we're also going to have an open house at the SETI Institute that I'd like to just spend one minute telling you about called Celebrating Science. It's on Saturday, May 16th from 2 to 4. It's free and open to everyone. It's a great family event. So if any of you have kids, um, we have interactive, uh, great, it's great science kits for older kids to do, ages like 8 to 15 or so. We have arts and crafts stuff for younger kids, lots of great interactive stuff. Um, we'll have a couple book signings by SETI authors. Um, Seth Shostak will be signing his latest book. Um, Andy Fracknow will be signing one of his books. And I'll be promoting uh, my latest book, Space Exploration for Dummies, which comes out in uh, June. So you can find out more about it and pre-order a copy there. And I'll be signing some copies of my previous books too. So if any of you have uh, kids or are just interested in finding out more about what we do here, I encourage you to come. You can uh, click on the link to uh, pre-register on the SETI homepage, or you can pick up one of these flyers at the front desk on your way out if you're interested. And I'm also happy to answer more questions about it. So without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, who is um, Philip Russell from the uh, Earth Science Division at NASA Ames Research Center. He'll be speaking about the um, role of aerosol particles in climate change. And um, Philip received his uh, undergraduate degree in physics from Wesleyan University, and he did his graduate work in physics at Stanford. He's actually been at NASA Ames since 1982, where he's currently in the Earth Science Division. And he's an expert in atmospheric science, remote sensing, satellite studies, and climate change. Thank you, Cynthia, for the nice introduction and for the invitation to speak here. And thanks to the Earth people who have come over to see this. And to those of you who are interested in planets other than Earth, uh, you'll see an appearance a couple times during the talk of uh, another planet that plays a, a natural role in this story of the effect of aerosol particles on Earth's climate. So the title is kind of long. Uh, I guess I'm kind of known for my long talk titles. Uh, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I put together this montage that you see here, uh, which will help me explain what I want to accomplish in this talk. Uh, let's start down in the lower right hand side. This shows the change in the Earth's global average temperature from 1880 to the present. Overall, the temperatures increased, which was caused by increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, but to my eye, the next uh, most prominent feature in this series is these negative going spikes in the record every once in a while. These spikes, it turns out, were caused by aerosols. And by aerosols, I mean suspensions of particles in the atmosphere that are, in general, smaller than cloud drops. Uh, so these spikes, which can be quite large, in some cases they're a third to a half of the overall temperature increase over these, uh, this more than 100-year period, they show the power of these tiny particles to affect the Earth's temperature. Uh, now, and I'll come back to this later and, and explain why this is. There's also uh, thought to be another effect of aerosol particles on the overall shape and slope of this long-term temperature increase. For example, it's thought that an increase in the aerosol particles caused this flattening in the temperature trace here, and a diminishment in those aerosols allowed the trace to resume its upward movement. We'll come back to that. But there's a great deal of uncertainty about what was the global population of aerosols back in 1940 to 60, for example, and there are also large questions about what aerosol concentrations will be in the future. And that's why the word uncertainty appears in the title of the talk. And what I will be looking at is the necessity of reducing uncertainties, how we have reduced them in the past, and why we need to reduce them still more. Now, uh, if you look at an image of the Earth from space, the most dominant atmospheric feature is these clouds. But in between the clouds, you can often see a kind of a brightening that has uh, 
less spatial structure typically than clouds. And this is caused by these aerosol particles that are typically smaller in size than cloud droplets. Uh, if you look at these images with finer resolution, and I'll show you some of them, uh, it becomes really obvious where these aerosol particles are coming from and that they can come from a variety of sources and so they have a variety of characteristics. That's shown kind of schematically in this uh, artist's drawing here. So these different kinds of aerosols include things like smoke from biomass burning, uh, dust from uh, dust storms in deserts, uh, urban pollution, which you see being carried off the coast of North America here, and volcanic emissions. Uh, now, seeing these aerosols from space with space-borne sensors, which is what these different satellites that I've shown up here do, is a lot easier than defining their characteristics, things like their size, their composition, their optical properties across the solar spectrum, and how much light they absorb versus scatter. But those are the kinds of things that you need to know in order to calculate this temperature change here. And that is why, first of all, NASA flies this variety of satellites to try to get this information and periodically supplements those satellites with these field experiments that fly aircraft under the satellites and also operate surface sensors for the purpose of testing the accuracy of the satellite retrievals and also supplementing those satellite retrievals. Okay, now I mentioned there was another planet that comes into this story. So some of you may recognize Venus here. Uh, Venus is shrouded by a haze or a cloud cover, and that's what makes it relevant to Earth climate change in a couple of ways that I will come back to. This is just sort of an advertisement for now, saying don't fall asleep. Uh, Venus will come up later. Okay, now back to this. I I said I would show you some real images, as opposed to this artist's image, of uh, the Earth from spacecraft with finer resolution so you can tell uh, that these are obviously aerosol events. And here's the first. So this is an image produced by an instrument called MODIS on NASA's Terra satellite, and it's smoke. And you can see that the smoke is obviously coming from these wildfires in Southern California in October of 2003. Here's another case of biomass burning smoke, this time from Alaska wildfires. Here's a case of desert dust being picked up by dust storms over the Sahara and carried out over the Atlantic towards the Canary Islands. Uh, here's some more widespread pall from dust, Sahara dust. Uh, this is urban industrial pollution being carried off India over the Bay of Bengal and onto the Indian Ocean. Uh, here's the east coast of the U.S. again, and you can see this haze pall sweeping out over the Atlantic Ocean. Usually these haze palls result from urban industrial pollution generated by the East Coast megalopolis and also power plants in the Ohio River Valley. Uh, but that is not always the case. Here's an example of another haze pall off the East Coast of the U.S. And this actually originated in Alaska in some of those Alaska wildfires. Uh, this is the 21st of July in 2004. Again, an image from MODIS, this time on the Aqua satellite. And if we look two days before that, on the 19th of July, this actually shows that smoke from Alaska being carried down the Mississippi River Valley to Louisiana and over the Gulf 
and then being carried east across the Gulf Coast of the U.S. And then later on, it was carried up and over the east, uh, the east coast. Uh, we actually flew an experiment under the edge of that uh, smoke in here. And later on, I'll show you how we were able to measure the radiative forcing efficiency of that smoke. OK, so the fact that we can see these aerosol events in this reflected solar imagery means that these particles are perturbing the flow of solar energy to the Earth and back up to space. And since that solar energy is the source that heats the Earth, they can change the temperature of the Earth and in turn change the infrared or long wave emission to space. So these perturbations in these radiative fields are cause, called radiative forcing of climate. And uh, I want to go back now and talk about the radiative forcings that are relevant to this temperature trace that we looked at before. So this is blown up now, so you can see there are many curves here. The blue curves are the observed temperatures over time. All the other curves are simulated temperature changes uh, as produced by uh, Jim Hansen and his colleagues at GISS on their global model. And the radiative forcings that drove those temperature changes are broken down up here by constituents. So these radiative forcings are measured in watts per square meter. And when they're positive, they tend to heat the Earth, when they're negative, they tend to cool. So the largest positive forcing over this time period is from the greenhouse gases. But there are some other important positive forcings. Uh, one of them is black carbon, which is an important aerosol constituent, absorbs solar radiation. And you can see this model's uh, forcing from black carbon here. Now, actually, there have been several papers published very recently uh, claiming that the forcing due to black carbon, which comes, for example, in diesel exhaust and also uh, fires, uh, forest fire smoke and oil fire smoke, there are recent papers showing that actually this may be quite an underestimate. And the uh, positive forcing due to black carbon maybe much more like half of the greenhouse gas forcing. So these are uh, just recent papers important to watch. Now, the negative forcings <coughs> are of two characters here. There are reflective tropospheric aerosols, which is this purple curve here. And you can see that this increase in the slope of the forcing by these tropospheric reflective aerosols coincides with this flattening of the temperature increase of the Earth here. But let's go back to these negative going spikes here. These negative going spikes correspond exactly with these forcings due to stratospheric aerosols. And these are a result of volcanic injections to the stratosphere. And the vol volcanoes have names like Pinatubo, El Chichon, Agung, and going back all the way to Krakatoa. Now, in my artist's rendition here, I show these uh, volcanic emissions as having these sort of black particles and kind of a black cloud. That's to mimic uh, what you can see with your eye when a volcano erupts. This is actually a photo of the Pinatubo eruption. But that's not what's causing the temperature change over the periods of a couple years that you saw in the previous slide. What causes that is the sulfur gases that you can't see in these photos that get injected into the stratosphere, and they oxidize there, and they form droplets of sulfuric acid. 
And that's what lasts for a couple years in the stratosphere, forms a veil, uh, reduces the solar radiation that gets to the surface, and reduces the surface temperature. Now this is the first time where Venus comes into the story. It turns out that sulfuric acid droplets in almost exactly the same concentration as they are in the Earth's stratosphere also make up the cloud and haze veil over Venus. And this was shown in the early 70s in another paper by Jim Hansen, who looked at previous measurements of the polarization of the light coming to the Earth from Venus. And he was able to show that the only way to explain the polarization of the light was uh, by concentrated sulfuric acid droplets, spherical droplets. And uh, this was a pretty impressive uh, achievement to me when you consider that before this publication by Jim Hansen, at least 15 different compositions had been proposed for the clouds of Venus. And they included things like water and water ice and solid carbon dioxide and carbon suboxide and sodium chloride and formaldehyde and mercury and so on. I won't read them all to you. But um, so this was a, a pretty impressive accomplishment of remote sensing and interpretation of optical measurements. And also the possibility of sulfuric acid, one of the 15 candidates, the possibility of sulfuric acid being the composition of the Venus clouds spurred some laboratory measurements of the optical properties of different concentrations of sulfuric acid uh, over a wide wavelength range in the solar. And those measurements of sulfuric acid optical properties really uh, enabled the calculations of these forcings from the sulfuric acid in the Earth's stratosphere. Okay. So let's get back to the uncertainty in radiative forcing. And I'll be talking about that with reference to this report that you see here, which I actually brought with me. It's kind of a well-worn Bible of mine. This is a report produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which is a creation of the United Nations and the World Meteorological Organization, which is charged um, every six or seven years with producing a survey of the current state of science in climate research, including an executive summary for uh, policymakers. And uh, this one that you see here is their fourth assessment report abbreviated as AR4. It was preceded by the third assessment report in 2001. Each of them includes an assessment of the uncertainty in radiative forcing. And this one reported that in 2007, the uncertainty in radiative forcing of Earth's climate was smaller than it had been in the two th the third report released in 2001. So in this talk, I want to look at the reasons for this reduction and what we need to do to reduce this uncertainty further in the future because the current uncertainty is too large to give us the degree of confidence that we want to have in future uh, predictions of climate change. So what I'll be looking at is this kind of tapestry. This looks like a tapestry to me of field experiments that occurred before the third assessment report, in between the third and fourth reports, and since the fourth report. And I'll pay a special attention to this Arctic experiment called ArcTAS because it has our most recent results and also because Ames played a, a big role uh, 
in this experiment. This is another way of looking at those experiments and their timeline. There are actually more here. And you can see there's kind of an alphabet soup of acronyms here. I won't uh, spell out all those acronyms for you, but you can see how these experiments fell onto the calendar over this period of about uh, 13 years. And uh, you can also see the amount of time that it takes to produce these IPCC reports. It takes about four and a half years to produce each one. And the models that are used to assess and predict climate change are actually frozen a half year into the process. And so you put this uh, duration to produce each of these reports together with the usual publication lag, which is typically a few years for results of these experiments to appear in the literature. And you can see that there's a considerable lag between a result from a given experiment being able to influence one of these reports, including the uncertainty in radiative forcing in those reports. Uh, I did want to point out another report. Uh, because it's just been published, uh, it's not an IPCC report. This is, rather than being the international, intergovernmental report that the IPCC produces, this is a product of the U.S. Climate Change Science Program. And there are many of these being produced now. But this particular one was led by NASA and uh, led by some colleagues of ours at Goddard in particular with contributions from NOAA and the Department of Energy. And so this uh, gives you a more recent uh, collection and assessment of the state of the science and also uh, a, a report that is more oriented towards NASA and US space-based capabilities. And it does uh, show influence of experiments that were conducted after experiments that have influenced this uh, IPCC assessment. So I commend that to you if you're interested in this kind of thing. But um, back to this IPCC time series um, and the reduction in radiative forcing uncertainty from here to here. Uh, let's take a look at what happened. And before we do that, I just want to be careful about the whoops, IPCC definition of radiative forcing. So as mentioned, it's a change in the radiation that perturbs the balance between incoming and outgoing. Uh, in the 2007 report, the definition became a little more specific. Uh, in particular, it's the change from 1750 to 2005, so before the Industrial Revolution to uh, the latest that they could get within the context of this report. And one thing to keep in mind for sure is it's a global average. So uh, let's look at uh, radiative forcings and uncertainties. This is a famous chart from the third assessment report that many of you are probably familiar with. So it shows the radiative forcings of different constituents in the atmosphere or different processes like change in solar irradiance. And each of these is shown with a, a column, an error bar, and an assessment of the level of scientific understanding. So once again, the largest positive forcing is from the greenhouse gases. And the error bar on that is relatively small compared to the column itself. The aerosol forcings are over here. And you can see that individually, the bars are small compared to this bar. But they can combine to get bigger relative to this. 
especially when you consider this um, black carbon increase radiative forcing that I just mentioned. And, the, and notice also that in some of these cases, there isn't even a column. There's only an error bar trying to capture a range. And that is reflected in these assessments down here of the level of scientific understanding, which is very low for all these aerosols, with one exception, the sulfates, which is low, whereas the greenhouse forcing is a high level of scientific understanding. So now let's contrast this with the situation after the fourth assessment report. Now, first of all, you notice that all the columns are turned on their side. Uh, why was that done? Well, the reason is that each of these error bars really represents a probability distribution. And so those probability distributions have to be convolved together to get the overall distribution or uncertainty in uh, the sum of all the forcings. Uh, and when that is done, you get the overall distributions that are shown here, where the blue curve is the distribution of radiative forcing, overall radiative forcing from all forcers from the third assessment report. And you notice that it's pretty broad, and it has this especially long tail going off to negative radiative forcing. This causes the mean and the median to differ substantially. And notice also that there's actually a probability of greater than one in four that the radiative forcing was negative. And remember, this is over the period from before the Industrial Revolution to about 2001, which was this period where there was <coughs> increase in global temperature. So this was a very unsatisfactory result. And it's improved considerably in the result of the fourth assessment report, which is the distribution in red here. Uh, notice that it's much narrower, more peaked. The mean and the median are close to each other. And in this case, the probability that the overall forcing was negative is negligible. So what was the reason for this narrowing? Well, there are two reasons, and they are improved uh, uncertainty, reduced uncertainty in the aerosol direct effect. That is the effect caused by scattering and absorption by aerosols in the atmosphere. And also the aerosol indirect effect, which is aerosols impacting the radiation balance by changing cloud properties. So. Um, when I found this result in my Bible and in this publication, I thought um, I was in the process of preparing this talk. I thought this is, first of all, it makes me feel pretty good about our field of aerosol science. Uh, we're working on something that's important enough to have a big impact on the overall radiative forcing, and we're making progress. So I thought I just now have to look in this big fat book and find their description of how these field experiments that I showed to you resulted in this uh, reduction of uncertainty. Um, and there we are again. And so the question I was asking was, does this smaller uncertainty reflect this tapestry of field programs? Well, I really wasn't able to extract that result very easily from this report. And here's the reason. This is a collection of bar charts of radiative forcings predicted by observations and by models. And you'll see that most of the results come from models. There are only three from observations. And these are all based on global fields of aerosol optical depth and properties from satellites. Well, I, I guess I really should have expected this, bearing in mind the fact that the forcings that are described in the IPCC reports are global average forcings. And none of these experiments 
give us global average results. They're just too small in spatial scale, and they're also too short in duration. So, and this is just an example of a global field of aerosol optical depth derived from a satellite, in this case, MODIS on Terra. So, this leaves us with the question of what is the role of these field programs in reducing uncertainty. And what I have come to conclude is that it is done by improving the satellite retrieval algorithms that produce those global fields and also improving the models in these five different ways. And in the rest of the talk, I'll show you examples of how we have done each of these things in these experiments. I also want to point out that there's a recent paper uh, by colleagues of ours from the Department of Energy, Steve Gann and Steve Schwartz, that reached a similar conclusion. They actually talk about a four-stage process in going from field studies to model predictions of temperature change. And they show that these field studies give us improved understandings of the processes that determine aerosol fields of amount and properties. That improved understanding is then codified in these zero-dimensional models, which then become modules in regional to global aerosol models. And those aerosol models are then incorporated in climate models. And I would just add a couple things to their conclusion. First of all, that these zero-dimensional models or modules are also used and refined and often developed in the analysis of field program data. And they get incorporated not only into climate models, but they actually get incorporated into satellite retrieval algorithms because it is not possible to retrieve unique solutions of all the aerosol properties that we need from the radiances that are measured by current satellites. The retrievals need to rely on a certain amount of knowledge that comes from these modules that are incorpor incorporated in the retrieval algorithms. We're trying to improve this situation with future satellites that will make better measurements of more things so that we'll, we will be less model dependent in these retrievals. But at the current time, these retrievals are model dependent. Okay, so uh, the first of these uh, five ways that these field programs contribute to reducing uncertainty is by measuring actual aerosol radiative effects and testing closure or agreement between measured radiation fields and aerosol optical and physicochemical properties. Uh, we've done this uh, starting way back in this TARFOX experiment over 10 years ago where we used broadband radiative fluxes. I won't show you that just now to save time, but we have since then gone to using flux spectra, that is wavelength resolved fluxes. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Uh, we do this by measuring simultaneously flux spectra for the f using these solar spectral flux radiometers, which were developed here at Ames under the engineering leadership of my branch chief, Warren Gore, who is here. So we measure the flux spectra with that instrument, and we measure aerosol optical depth spectra with our tracking sun photometer, which we also developed at Ames in our sun photometer group. So here's an example of using these two measurements to determine aerosol radiative forcing efficiency. And what we do is measure flux spectra and optical depth spectra while underflying differing amounts of aerosols 
and measuring the way the radiative flux changes as the aerosol optical depth changes. This produces a plot like this of the solar energy or flux change versus the aerosol amount. And the slope of those curves is called the aerosol radiative forcing efficiency. It's the flux change per change in aerosol optical depth. Uh, this is a result from a paper led by uh, Jens Redeman in our sun photometer group. And he was able to do this for 10 cases. And uh, there was actually kind of a secular trend in radiative forcing efficiency during this experiment. Ranging from negative about 110 watts per square meter per unit optical depth up to about negative 60. So these negative forcings were largest early in the experiment. And this is because early in the experiment, aerosol optical depths off the east coast of the US were dominated by these Alaska wildfire smokes, which are more absorbing than the urban industrial aerosols, which are mostly sulfate, which came later in the experiment. OK. Another thing that is done in these experiments is determining actual aerosol properties. And uh, in this case, I will actually start with the Tarfox experience and show how we get an important aerosol property that is single scattering albedo from these studies that combine flux changes with aerosol optical depth changes. So in Tarfox, we had flux radiometers and optical depth measures on this aircraft, which in this case moved the aircraft vertically rather than horizontally to get <coughs> underneath varying amounts of aerosols. And again, measured the flux change simultaneously with the aerosol change. And the result is shown by these data points here. Now, it's also possible to calculate the expected flux change as a function of optical depth, assuming different values of aerosol single scattering albedo. And you can see some of these curves fit the data better than others. So in this way, you can extract a best fit single scattering albedo. And in this case, the bet best fit was a single scattering albedo of about 0.9. In the TARFOX experiment, we were able to measure single scattering albedo by a number of different techniques. One of the techniques was by actually measuring scattering and absorption and hygroscopic growth in situ. That was done thousands of times and actually produced these distributions of single scattering albedo. Then Two other techniques were used. The technique of skylight retrieval, which is what the AeroNet network of sun sky photometers does. It obtained this result here. And then a fourth technique used LIDAR measurements. And you can see uh, agreement here is pretty good. In fact, it's better than it was in uh, previous experiments where these things scattered all over the place. But there is this nagging result here that the result that comes from the flux changes shows the, the most absorption, the largest single scattering albedo. And this leaves a lingering question of whether we may be mixing some gas absorption in with the aerosol absorption. And that is a, uh, uh, and a weakness of these broadband flux studies. And so once again, we have taken these studies to the spectrally resolved part, which uh, <coughs> helps you exclude possible effects of absorbing gases. And the way that works is you actually measure the change in net flux between two different altitudes in the atmosphere, which gives you a spectrum, in this case, of absorption. And you can recognize these peaks in absorption, which are gas absorption. You can also, if you have an optical depth spectrum, you can calculate a spectrum of absorption, which is this red curve here, uh, 
by assuming a single scattering albedo spectrum. You can see that the assumed single scattering albedo spectrum in this case underestimates the absorption. And so this technique works by adjusting wavelength by wavelength the assumed single scattering albedo to bring these into agreement. And the result of that is a single scattering albedo spectrum, a best fit spectrum. This has been done in four different experiments now, and you can see that in these different experiments, there can be markedly different shapes of these single scattering albedo spectra. The reason is that these experiments were looking at different kinds of aerosols. These are, this was an experiment that looked at desert dust. This is urban industrial. This is, uh, oh, sorry, this was smoke. This was biomass smoke. This was desert dust, and this was a mixture of desert dust and urban industrial. The interesting thing is that if you take these very different shapes of single scattering albedo and express them as absorption optical depth spectra, which is what is done in this plot here, they all form straight lines, essentially, on a log-log plot which means they're all power laws. But what distinguishes these straight lines from each other is their slopes, which on this log-log plot is equivalent to this exponent, the absorption angstrom exponent. Now, theory predicts that for black carbon, the absorption angstrom exponent should equal one. And in two of these experiments, Tarfox and ICART, both of which were conducted off the east coast of the U.S., the results approach this theoretical value for black carbon. So this uh, suggests that in that region, absorption is dominated by black carbon. All the other places have steeper slopes. The steepest slope is this one here, which is from Pride. This is the Sahara Desert Dust. And the, uh, this case here, uh, let's see, yeah, this one is Ace Asia, which is the one with a mixture of desert dust and biomass smoke. And then this truly intermediate value is the pure biomass smoke in South Africa. Okay. So, uh, also in these experiments, we are now able to get single scattering albedo spectra from in situ measurements. A completely different technique that gives a result with very much in common with these purely radiometric results. And this is an example of those in situ results. So there are three things shown here. Plotted on the vertical axis is the absorption angstrom exponent. That's what I just showed you in the previous plot. On the horizontal axis is the organic fraction of non-refractory aerosol mass. And the color code that is used here shows the scattering angstrom exponent, which is a measure of particle size with the largest particles in coded in blue, which corresponds to dust in this experiment, which was done over Mexico. So this says that if you exclude dust, the dark blue points. The remaining points are well described by this straight line. And not only is it linear, but it has intercept one, which again is the theoretical value for black carbon. So this says that particles that have no organics and no dust have the Angstrom, the absorption angstrom exponent for black carbon. As you add organics, the absorption angstrom exponent increases. And if you add dust, it increases still more. And that has a heck of a lot in common with the results that were shown here, obtained completely independent by radiometric methods. Okay. So now I want to show you some results from ArcTAS, our most recent experiment. Uh, 
we did this just last year. We actually had two deployments uh, in the springtime when things were mostly covered with ice and snow in the Arctic. In the summertime when biomass burning produces a lot of smoke. Uh, there were three NASA aircraft involved. The aircraft that was instrumented to look at aerosols and radiation was the P3, so I'll mostly show you results from that. I also wanted to show this because Ames had a number of leadership roles in this experiment. Hanwant Singh of our branch was the project scientist. I was the platform scientist on the P3, and Kent Schiffer from our Earth Science Project Office was the project manager. Uh, why did we want to do an experiment in the Arctic last year? Well, first of all, this was during the third international polar year. So this was NASA's contribution to IPY. But also, and actually the reason for the IPY, is that the Arctic is undergoing rapid change. It's the place on Earth where warming is occurring the fastest. Also, boreal forest fires are increasing. Uh, there's a potentially large response to, for example, forest fire smoke uh, because the polar ice sheets are melting and so the albedo of the Arctic is reducing um, and giving a positive feedback to uh, any warming that occurs. Uh, there's also some evidence that snow albedo is decreasing because of soot depositing on it. So uh, that just means that in addition to measuring aerosols in the atmosphere, we also made measurements of surface albedo to try to capture this effect of black carbon on the surface. So we made a lot of flights and I'll show you results from just a couple of them. We are still early in the analyses from this experiment. It's uh, less than a year since the summer campaign. But one of the things that we were able to do for the first time in this experiment was extend these flux change absorption measurements to two aircraft carrying identical flux radiometers, these same solar spectral flux radiometers developed here at Ames. So this allowed us to measure the flux th at the top and the bottom of the layer simultaneously. And we actually did this while flying under a third aircraft that had a LIDAR on it to map the aerosols between the two aircraft. So this cross section that you see here is aerosol extinction derived from the LIDAR. And these are the flight tracks. So this is the NASA P3 here, which carried the flux radiometers on the lower leg and also measured aerosol optical depth. And this is the NOAA P3. And this is a time series of the aerosol optical depth difference between the two. And this peak here corresponds to this stuff here. So analysis of this event is still underway but it has gotten to the point now of producing this uh, absorption spectrum and then calculating fits to the absorption spectrum for different values of single scattering albedo. And the single scattering albedo for this case is bounded between these two values, kind of centered on 0 0.9. Now interestingly, in this case, it appears that we have a disagreement with the in situ measurements of absorption here. And uh, that's what tends to happen in these experiments. And that's when you really learn about these measurement techniques is when you try to figure out the reason for those disagreements. But that's still ongoing. Uh, another thing we do in these experiments is determining actual aerosol properties and using them to test models. So during these experiments, there are a number of modelers present who use their global and regional models to predict fields of constituents, in this case, aerosol optical depth. And we use these predictions to determine our flight uh, plans. 
And uh, in this case, the models were predicting that in this region, which is between Fairbanks, Alaska and Thule, Greenland, there would be aerosols coming from two different sources. That in this region, the aerosols would have been transported from Asia and in this region from North America. So we planned our flight track to cross those two areas and made in situ measurements of the composition of those aerosols. And you can see, indeed, we found a difference. In the aerosols coming from Asia, sulfates and organics, red and green here, were just about equal. In the North American pollution, sulfates were more dominant. So this provides a, a good test of model predictions because the models also now do predict these aerosols by component. They produce, they predict each of these components. Okay, let me quickly show a result from summer. Uh, in summer, we were based in Cold Lake, Alberta here, and the reason is that there's this band of forest fires which occurs every year. It varies from year to year. Uh, last year, we got lucky, and most of the fires were very close to Cold Lake in this region here. Uh, this is just what these fires look like as you're approaching them to give you a feel for what these experiments were like. John Livingston was on the aircraft and Jim Podolsky was on the aircraft and you get bounced around when you fly into these plumes and the aircraft feels the convection. Um, but I want to show you some results for a day in which we were able to get a triple whammy here. Testing satellite data products, determining actual aerosol properties, and testing models. So this is a day where we actually had two different model predictions of smoke to the east of where we were based. Uh, this shows one of the smoke predictions. We also had predictions of carbon monoxide measured by Jim Podolsky's instrument and a good indicator of combustion. And so we planned our flight track to go into that region and also underfly Calypso. Calypso is a space-based LIDAR that flies in this so-called A-train uh, collection of satellites. It measures vertical profiles of aerosols with a laser. Um, so this shows in more detail our flight track. Uh, we went out there with the P-3, flew along that track with the B-200, that's the airborne LIDAR above us. This is a cross-section of aerosol extinction as measured by the airborne LIDAR. We flew the P3 first in a vertical spiral through that aerosol layer that the LIDAR, the airborne LIDAR, was measuring so we could compare those two measurements. And uh, so here's that extinction cross-section again. If you integrate it in the vertical, you get an optical thickness cross-section from which you can extract a vertical profile. That's the black here. And then the red is the uh, optical thickness profile from the sun photometer. Pretty good agreement there. Also, during that spiral, we made in situ measurements of uh, extinction to compare with the LIDAR extinction profile. Pretty good agreement there. And then this was all done within the Calypso uh, flight track so that we could compare the Calypso spaceborne LIDAR with, the, with everything, including the airborne LIDAR, which is called HSRL here. And you can see good agreement in the upper reaches of the smoke layer, but not so good farther down in the smoke layer. Another mystery for us to figure out. Okay, this is just to show you that because Calypso is in the A-train, whenever we underfly Calypso, within a few minutes we're also underflying MODIS and another aerosol instrument called OMI on this satellite, Aura. So it allows us to do comparisons with those. Uh, 
In those comparisons, we fly the aircraft as close to the surface as possible so that the optical depth measured by the sun photometer on the aircraft measures as close as possible to the full column that's being viewed by the satellites. And so here's a comparison of an optical depth spectrum, optical depth versus wavelength, from the sun photometer with the satellite results. There's pretty good agreement with the results from one satellite instrument, MODIS. Not so good agreement with the results from the newer instrument, OMI. Uh, so we're still working on that also. But I just want to uh, depart from ArcTAS to try to finish up here with a bit of a summary. So this was NAS NASA's contribution to the International Polar Year. There was a lot of collaboration, including interagency and international. Uh, we have gotten this beautiful data set from the P3 that links these air, surface, and space measurements and addresses all of our goals, which are basically to link atmospheric radiation to the microphysics and the chemistry of the haze and also to the Arctic surfaces. And we wanted to do this because this is what we need for reliable interpretations of the satellite inversions, refining the model products, and assessing climate forcing in terms of emissions or mitigation strategies. Uh, we had the lead roles that I showed you. The analyses are in their early stages, but we are heading in just a few weeks for an important data workshop by this uh, international project, PolarCat, of which ArcTAS was a part. And then at the fall AGU meeting in December, we will have special sessions dedicated to ArcTAS. Um, I was going to say a little bit more about satellite validation, but I'm going to skip through that because uh, when Adrian asked me to give this talk, he did ask me to say something about the future especially the future of aircraft. And I'll say a little bit about satellites too. And here's where Venus comes in again. So uh, this great advance, in my view, that Jim Hansen made here in determining the composition of the clouds of Venus has made Jim Hansen into a persistent advocate of having Earth viewing polarimeters to make uh, improved measurements of aerosols on Earth. And so far, uh, in spite of Jim's persistent advocacy for this, NASA has never flown one of these. But it's about to happen uh, on a satellite called GLORY which will become a part of the A-Train and is scheduled for launch later this year or early next year. Launch is being delayed because of the loss of OCO on its launch. But a lot is expected from these polarimeter measurements that we will be able to determine a lot of aerosol properties in both fine and coarse modes without having to rely so much on models, as I mentioned before. So that's the early future uh, in terms of Earth viewing satellites to determine aerosol properties. And uh, pretty soon after uh, Glory goes up and gets established, there will be a field campaign that will make use of Glory and test it. And we're heading for Southeast Asia to do that. Why are we going to Southeast Asia? Well, because it's in a region where aerosols are known to be very important. There's a lot of biomass burning there in Indonesia and so on. There's urban stuff from India coming out there sometimes. It's also probably the most difficult place on Earth to do remote sensing of aerosols from space because clouds are a persistent feature there. But that also makes it a very fertile area to study aerosol cloud interactions. So that's where we'll be going for our next major field program. 
Uh, beyond glory, a number of satellites have been recommended by this so-called decadal survey of the National Research Council, and their recommendations are in three tiers, which determines the time of projected launch. But several of these are aimed at measuring aerosols and their radiative effects. One in particular is called ACE in tier two here. It stands for aerosols, clouds, and ecosystems. And uh, it is planned to combine observations of aerosols and the ocean on a single platform and the reason for that is that the retrievals of aerosols and ocean properties are inextricably intertwined in the retrieval. One of those is noise for the other's signal. And so if you don't do the best job of on both of them at the same time, you are settling for uncertainties that you can get rid of by doing them both at the same time. So to address these science goals, there's a suite of instruments, uh, all of which are improvements over what's flying up there now. Uh, the first one listed here is this multi-angle imaging spectropolarimeter. So it will include polarimetry like uh, GLORY will do, but GLORY only has a measurement track which is directly below the satellite. It's not an imaging polarimeter. This is an imaging polarimeter, so it will be able to cover these broad swaths like MODIS and MISER do and still get uh, polarization information along with the spectrometric information. Uh, there will also be an optical spectrometer optimized for ocean measurements and an infrared scanner to get cloud top heights and a couple of active sensors, not only a LIDAR, and so this will be the first time that a LIDAR has flown on the same platform with these kinds of measurements, but also a radar. And the idea here is to have the probing electromagnetic radiation be responding to this full range of particle sizes including the fine and coarse modes of aerosols, typical cloud droplets, and rain droplets. So this will enable studies of aerosol cloud precipitation interactions such as have never been done before. And there are a couple of other decadal survey instruments that are aimed at aerosols, and I won't take the time to explain them in detail. But Adrian particularly asked if I would say something about this new aircraft that NASA just acquired. It's called the Global Hawk. And uh, it is a remotely piloted aircraft that has a ceiling of 65,000 feet, so way above commercial aircraft traffic, sort of like the ER-2. And it has a duration of 31 hours or more, much more than the ER-2. And as we speak, uh, preparations are being made for the first science uh, mission with this aircraft, which will occur this summer. It's called GLOPAC, which stands for Global Hawk Pacific. And the uh, aircraft is being instrumented down at Dryden right now with this wide range of instruments, including one from Ames, a meteorological measurement system. And uh, the idea is to use this long duration capability to make these six very long flights out over the Pacific and measure things focusing on the uh, upper troposphere, lower stratosphere region where there's exchange between the troposphere and the stratosphere. Uh, but included will be uh, measurements of aerosols in situ there and also a LIDAR to measure aerosol profiles and cloud profiles. Okay, a closing point on instruments. Instruments need to keep up, Air, airborne instruments need to keep up with the satellite advances. And a lot of that is being done uh, 
but I just wanted to mention that in our own group, we're working on an instrument that combines the capabilities of our current sun tracking photometer with the sky scanning, which is done by this AeroNet network and enables retrievals of more aerosol information with spectrometry. So we're sort of trying to do three in one here. And uh, this instrument is called Four Star, stands for Spectrometer for Sky Scanning, Sun Tracking, Atmospheric Research. Uh, this is a drawing of what we think it will look like and we're looking at flying it on a variety of aircraft and participating in an experiment to study aerosols and clouds off the east coast of the US in the summer of 2011. So this is my last slide, I promise. Um, but these are the thoughts that I wanted to leave you with. Uh, these integrated field experiments have indeed made major contributions to reducing uncertainties, uh, which are documented in these IPCC reports. They do it in kind of an indirect way because the IPCC reports focus on the global average and these experiments don't measure the global average, nor do they measure long-term changes. But what we learn in these experiments allows us to test and improve both the satellite retrievals and the global models. And both the satellite retrievals and the global models are key inputs to the uncertainty assessments and the climate forcing predictions that are in the IPCC reports. Uh, there is a continuing need for such studies. Some of the slides that I skipped on satellite validation show that whenever a new satellite sensor goes up, there are, are always unexpected results that need to be unscrambled and explained, and these field experiments are a key contributor to that. And that's why we need to continue to make advances in our instrumentation. That's it. Thank you. Phil, I have a question about interpreting the IPCC. Uh, in the case of greenhouse gases, there's a monotonic increase and so on. But aerosols must fluctuate and depend on volcanic eruptions and forest fires. So what does their term, what do they mean that as of a particular date? This is what the uh, contribution is from aerosols, and it may be different a year earlier or a year later? That is true. And in fact, in this uh, IPCC fourth assessment report, they were careful to say this assessment is as of 2005. So we're going to look at the information that we can get on the global and regional aerosol amounts and characteristics as of 2005 and measure their impact on the radiation field and compare it to what we think aerosols impact on the radiation field was in 1750 <laughs> before the industrial revolution and the premise there is that natural aerosols we don't think have changed appreciably over that time period, with the exception of stratospheric volcanic aerosols. And fortunately, 2005 is in a lull for stratospheric uh, volcanically induced aerosols. But those are the kinds of assumptions that go into these assessments. Uh, it's, it is hard to project back into the past as to what aerosol impacts on radiation were in the past. Well, in that regard, I think you mentioned there's particular uncertainty in like in the 40s through the 60s in aerosols and so on. Mm -hmm. Astronomers have been, even before that, observing, trying to do photometry through the Earth's atmosphere 
measuring so-called extinction, which is a combination of things. Has anybody tried to get information from the past from that kind of data? Yes. And I don't know where that stands. But I do know that uh, I've seen some papers on using those data for that purpose. And I don't know whether they have found their way into that uh, time series of forcings that Jim Hansen's model uses, for example. I don't know. It's possible. How well is the production of individual type of, of anthropogenic aerosols that you're analyzing known in the sense especially of if we find that certain ones have certain forcings, um, value of mitigation or, uh, it's, or danger of mitigation. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yes, um, that's a good question. And it is most important to projections of what's going to happen in the future. And for example, how many aerosols are produced or what aerosol optical depth and so on would be produced by a given amount of fossil fuel burning, assuming a given technology for cleaning up power plant emissions. So those are all things that have to be taken into account and, and are included in these so-called scenarios of the future. And uh, some of that understanding is, is better for some aerosol types than for others. It's probably the best for sulfates produced by fossil fuel burning in power plants. Uh, it's not so good for other types. There's quite a bit of Russian literature on uh, metallic aerosols high in the atmosphere. And I recently read, ran across a suborbital rocket data which shows that there is, I think around 100 kilometer, a peak in the sodium content. Is this related in some ways to things that you are discussing? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the, uh, the optical depth of these higher aerosol layers in the atmosphere is negligible compared to the optical depths that are needed to cause significant radiative forcing, like the tropospheric aerosols. And uh, I don't think there is a phenomenological connection between those aerosols and the tropospheric aerosols. Back to the time variability of aerosols. Um, has it, does anyone go back and say, take the year after the Pinatubo eruption and do one of those plots showing the magnitude of the, the forcing from aerosols versus uh, other terms? Uh, yes, and uh, a lot of our current knowledge about the uh, interplay between aerosol forcings and greenhouse gas forcings comes from the Pinatubo experience because that occurred during a time when we had pretty good measurements of a lot of different things. So we have and in that case, well, did it go ne negative instead of positive? Uh, uh, well, the, 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 the aerosol plus the greenhouse yeah. gases, no, uh, it was still positive. But it, it was, but the negative uh, re was about half as big as the greenhouse forcing. Uh, one sort of rule of thumb that you can look at for that is over the past century, the greenhouse warming has increased the surface temperature by about a degree C. Uh, and the Pinatubo cooling was about a half a degree C. Now, of course, the, the OK, that, that's all I'll say about that. Neither, both of those are, uh, include some unrealized forcing because of the long lag time uh, 
caused by the thermal inertia of the oceans and so on. Thank you.